The Seen Society by Eric Fromm. This is the third part of chapter five, Man in Capitalistic Society. Two, the principle of non-frustration. As I have pointed out before, anonymous authority and automaton conformity are largely the result of our mode of production, which requires quick adaptation to the machine, disciplined mass behavior, common taste and obedience without the use of force. Another facet of our economic system, the need for mass consumption, has been instrumental in creating a feature in the social character of modern man, which constitutes one of the most striking contrasts to the social character of the 19th century. I am referring to the principle that every desire must be satisfied immediately. No wish must be frustrated. The most obvious illustration of this principle is to be found in our system of buying on the installment plan. In the 19th century, you bought what you needed. When you had saved the money for it, today you buy what you need. Oh, sorry. In the, oh, I read that weird. In the 19th century, you bought what you needed when you had saved the money for it. Today you buy what you need or do not need on credit and the function of advertising is largely to coax you into buying and to whet your appetite for things so that you can be coaxed. You live in a circle, you buy on the installment plan, and about the time you have finished paying, you sell and you buy again, the latest model. The principle that desires must be satisfied without much delay has also determined sexual behavior, especially since the end of the First World War. A crude form of misunderstood Freudianism used to furnish the appropriate rationalizations. The idea being that neuroses result from repressed sexual strivings, that frustrations were traumatic, and the less you repress, the healthier you were. Even parents anxious to give their children everything they wanted, lest they be frustrated, acquired a complex. Unfortunately, many of these children, as well as their parents, landed on the analyst's couch, provided they could afford it. The greed for things and the inability to postpone the satisfaction of wishes as characteristic of modern man has been stressed by thoughtful observers, such as Max, Scheler, and Bergson. It has been given its most poignant expression by Aldous Huxley in The Brave New World. Among the slogans by which the adolescents in The Brave New World are conditioned, one of the most important ones is the never is never put off till tomorrow the fun you can have today. It is hammered into them, 200 repetitions twice a week from 14 to 16 and a half. This instant realization of wishes, of wishes is felt as happiness. Everybody is happy nowadays is another of the brave new world slogans. People get what they want and they never want what they can't get. This need for the immediate consumption of commodities and the immediate consumption of sexual desires is coupled in the brave new world as in our own. It is considered immoral to keep one love partner beyond a relatively short time. Love is short-lived sexual desire, which must be satisfied immediately. The greatest care is taken to prevent you from loving anyone too much. There's no such thing as divided allegiance. You're so conditioned that you can't help doing what you ought to do. And what you ought to do is on the whole so pleasant. So many of the natural impulses are allowed free play that there really aren't any temptations to resist. This lack of inhibitions of desires leads to the same result as the lack of overt authority, the paralysis, and eventually the destruction of the self. If I do not postpone the satisfaction of my wish and am conditioned only to wish for what I can get, I have no conflicts, no doubts. No decision has to be made. I am never alone with myself because I am always busy, either working or having fun. I have no need to be aware of myself as myself because I am constantly absorbed, having pleasure. I am a system of desires and satisfactions. I have to work in order to fulfill my desires, and these very desires are constantly stimulated and directed by the economic machine. Most of these appetites are synthetic, even sexual appetite is by far not as natural as it is made out to be. It is to some extent stimulated artificially. And it needs to be if we want to have people as the contemporary system needs them. People who feel happy, 
who have no doubts, who have no conflicts, who are guided without the use of force. Having fun consists mainly in the satisfaction of consuming and taking in commodities, sights, food, drinks, cigarettes, people, lectures, books, movies. All are consumed, swallowed. The world is one great object for our appetite, a big apple, a big bottle, a big breast. We are the sucklers, the eternally expectant ones, the hopeful ones, and the eternally disappointed ones. How can we help being disappointed if our birth stops the breast of the mother? If we are never weaned, if we remain overgrown babes, if we never go beyond the receptive orientation. So people do worry, feel inferior, inadequate, guilty. They sense that they live without living, that life runs through their hands like sand. How do they deal with their troubles, which stem from the passivity of constant taking in? By another form of passivity, a constant spilling out, as it were, by talking. Here, as in the case of authority and consumption, an idea which once was productive has been turned into its opposite. 3. Free association and free talk. Freud had discovered the principle of free association. By giving up the control of your thoughts in the presence of a skilled listener, you can discover your unconscious feelings and thoughts without being asleep or crazy or drunk or hypnotized. The psychoanalyst reads between your lines. He is capable of understanding you better than you understand yourself because you have freed your thinking from the limitations of conventional thought control. But free association soon deteriorated, like freedom and happiness. First, it deteriorated in the orthodox psychoanalytic procedure itself. Not always, but often. Instead of giving rise to a meaningful expression of imprisoned thoughts, it became meaningless chatter. Other therapeutic schools reduced the role of the analyst to that of a sympathetic listener, who repeats in a slightly different version the words of the patient, without trying to interpret or to explain. All this is done with the idea that the patient's freedom must not be interfered with. The Freudian idea of free association has become the instrument of many psychologists who call themselves counselors, although the only thing they do not do is to counsel. These counselors play an increasingly large role as private practitioners and as advisors in industry. What is the effect of the procedure? Obviously not a cure which Freud had in mind, when he devised free association as a basis for understanding the unconscious. Rather, a release of, of tension, which results from talking things out in the presence of a sympathetic listener. Your thoughts, as long as you keep them within yourself, may disturb you. But something fruitful may come out of this disturbance. You mull them over. You think, you feel. You may arrive at a new thought born out of this travail. But when you talk right away, when you do not let your thoughts and feelings build up pressure, as it were, they do not become fruitful. It is exactly the same as with unobstructed consumption. You are a system in which things go in and out continuously, and within it is nothing, no tension, no digestion, no self. Freud's discovery of free association had the aim of finding out what went on in you underneath the surface, of discovering who you really were. The modern talking to the sympathetic listener has the opposite, although an avowed aim. Its function is to make a man forget who he is, provided he has still some memory. To lose all tension and with it all sense of self. Just as one oils machines, one oils people, and especially those in the mass organizations of work. One oils them with, pl with pleasant slogans, material advantages, and with the sympathetic understanding of the psychologists. The talking and listening to eventually has become the indoor sport of those who cannot afford a professional listener or prefer the layman for one reason or another. It has become fashionable, fashionable, sophisticated to talk things out. There is no inhibition, no sense of shame, no holding back. One speaks about the tragic occurrences of one's own life with the same ease as one would talk about another person of no particular interest or as one would speak about the various troubles one has had with one's car. Indeed, psychology and psychiatry are the process of changing their function fundamentally, are in the process of changing their function fundamentally. 
From the Delphic Oracles, Know Thyself, to Freud's psychoanalytic therapy, the function of psychology was to discover the self, to understand the individual, to find the truth that makes you free. Today, the function of psychiatry, psychology, and psychoanalysis threatens to become the tool in the manipulation of men. The specialists in this field tell you what the normal person is and correspondingly what is wrong with you. They devise the methods to help you adjust, be happy, be normal. In the brave new world, this conditioning is done from the first month of fertilization by chemical means until after puberty. With us, it begins a little later. Constant repetition by newspaper, radio, television does most of the conditioning, but the crowning achievement of manipulation is modern psychology. What Taylor did for indus industrial work, the psychologists do for the whole personality, all in the name of understanding and freedom. There are many exceptions to this among psychiatrists, psychologists, and psychoanalysts, but it becomes increasingly clear that these professions are in the process of becoming a serious danger to the development of man, and their practitioners are evolving into the priests of the new religion of fun, consumption, and self selflessness, into the specialists of manipulation, into the spokesmen for the alienated personality. 4. Reason, Conscience, Religion What becomes of reason, conscience, and religion in an alienated world? Superficially seen, they prosper. There is hardly any illiteracy to speak of in the Western countries. More and more people go to college in the United States. Everybody reads the newspapers and talks reasonably about world affairs. As to conscience, most people act quite decently in their narrow personal sphere, in fact, surprisingly so, considering their general confusion. As far as religion is concerned, it is well known that church affiliation is higher than ever, and the vast majority of Americans believe in God, or so they say in public opinion polls. However, one does not need to dig too deeply to arrive at less pleasant findings. If we talk about reason, we must first decide what human capacity we are referring to. As I have suggested before, we must differentiate between intelligence and reason. By intelligence, I mean the ability to manipulate concepts for the purpose of achieving some practical end. The chimpanzee who puts the two sticks together in order to get at the banana because no one of the two is long enough to do the job, uses intelligence. So do we all when we go about our business, figuring out how to do things. Intelligence, in this sense, is taking things for granted as they are, making combinations which have the purpose of, of facilitating their manipulation. Intelligence is thought in the service of biological survival. Reason, on the other hand, aims at understanding it tries to find out what is behind the surface, to recognize the kernel, the essence of the reality which surrounds us. Reason is not without a function, but its function is not to further physical as much as mental and spiritual existence. However, often in individual and social life, reason is required in order to predict, considering that prediction often depends on recognition of forces which operate underneath the surface, and prediction sometimes is necessary even for physical survival. Reason requires relatedness and a sense of self. If I am only the, pa the passive receptor of impressions, thought, opinions, I can compare them, manipulate them, but I cannot penetrate them. Descartes dedu deduced the existence of myself as an individual from the fact that I think. I doubt, so he argued, hence I think. I think, hence I am. The reverse is true too. Only if I am I, if I have not lost my individuality in the it, can I think, that is, can I make use of my reason. Closely related to this is the lacking sense of reality which is characteristic of the alienated personality. To speak of the lacking sense of reality in modern man is contrary to the widely held idea that we are distinguished from most periods of history by our greater realism. But to speak of our realism is almost like a paranoid distortion. What realists, who are playing with weapons which may lead to the destruction of all modern civilization, if not of our earth itself? If an individual were found doing just that, he would be locked up immediately, and if he prided himself on his realism, the psychiatrist would consider this an additional and rather serious symptom of a diseased mind. 
But quite aside from this, the fact is that modern man exhibits an amazing lack of realism for all that matters. For the meaning of life and death, for happiness and suffering, for feeling and serious thought, he has covered up the whole reality of human existence and replaced it with his artificial, prettified picture of a pseudo-reality, not too different from the savages who lost their land and freedom for glittering glass beads. Indeed, he is so far away from human reality that he can say what the inhabitants of the brave new world, when the individual feels, the community reels. Another factor in contemporary society already mentioned is destructive to reason. Since nobody ever does the whole job, but only a fraction of it, since the dimension of things and of the organization of people is too vast to be understood as a whole, nothing can be seen in its totality. Hence, the laws underlying the phenomena cannot be observed. Intelligence is sufficient to manipulate properly one sector of a larger unit. Whether it is a machine or a state, but reason can develop only if it is geared to the whole, if it deals with observable and manageable entities. Just as our ears and eyes function only within certain quanti quantitative limits of wavelength, our reason too is bound by what is observable, as a whole and in its total functioning. To put it differently, beyond a certain order of bigness, concreteness is necessarily lost and abstractification takes place. With it, the sense for reality fades out. The first one to see this problem was Aristotle, who thought that a city which transcended in number what we would call today a small town was not livable. In observing the quality of thinking in alienated man, it is striking to see how his intelligence has developed and how his reason has deteriorated. He takes his reality for granted. He wants to eat it, consume it, touch it, manipulate it. He does not even ask what is behind it, why things are as they are, and where they are going. You cannot eat the meaning, you cannot consume the sense, and as far as the future is concerned, après nous le déluge. Even from the 19th century to our day, there seems to have occurred an observable increase in stupidity, if by this we mean the opposite to reason, rather than to intelligence. In spite of the fact that everybody reads the daily paper religiously, there is an absence of understanding of the meaning of political events, which is truly frightening, because our intelligence helps us to produce weapons which our reason is not capable of controlling. Indeed, we have the know-how, but we do not have the know-why, nor the know-what-for. We have many persons with good and high intelligence quotients, but our intelligence tests measure the ability to memorize, to manipulate thoughts quickly, but not to reason. All this is true notwithstanding the fact that there are men of outstanding reason in our midst, whose thinking is as profound and vigorous as ever existed in the history of the human race. But they think apart from the general herd thought, and they are looked upon with suspicion, even if they are needed for their extraordinary achievements in the natural sciences. The new automatic brains are indeed a good illustration of what is meant here by intelligence. They manipulate data which are, met, which are fed into them. They compare, select, and eventually come out with results more quickly or more error-proof error than human intelligence could. However, the condition of all this is that the basic data are fed into them beforehand. What the electric brain cannot do is think creatively to arrive at an insight into the essence of the observed facts, to go beyond the data with which it has been fed. The machine can duplicate or even improve on intelligence, but it cannot simulate reason. Ethics, at least in the meaning of the Greco-Judeo-Christian tradition, is inseparable from reason. Ethical behavior is based on the faculty of making value judgments on the basis of reason. It means deciding between good and evil, and to act upon the decision. Use of reason presupposes the presence of self. So does ethical judgment and action. Furthermore, ethics, whether it is that of monotheistic religion or that of secular humanism, is based on the principle that no institution and no thing is higher than any human individual, that the aim of life is to unfold man's love and reason, and that every other human activity has to be subordinated to this aim. How then can ethics be a significant part of a life in which the individual becomes an automaton, 
in which he serves the big it. Furthermore, how can conscience develop when the principle of life is conformity? Conscience, by its very nature, is non-conforming. It must be able to say no when everybody else says yes. In order to say this no, it must be certain in the rightness of the judgment on which the no is based. To the degree to which a person conforms, he cannot hear the voice of, the voice of his conscience, much less act upon it. Conscience exists only when man experiences himself as man, not as a thing, as a commodity. Concerning things which are exchanged on the market, there exists another quasi-ethical code, that of fairness. The question is whether they are exchanged at a fair price. No tricks and no force interfering with the fairness of the bargain. This fairness, not good and evil, is the ethical principle of the market, and it is the ethical principle governing the life of the marketing personality. This principle of fairness, no doubt, makes for a certain type of ethical behavior. You do not lie, cheat, or use force. You, you even give the other person a chance. If you act according to the code, devote your life to the aim of developing your spiritual powers. is not part of the fairness ethics. We live in a paradoxical situation. We practice fairness ethnic ethics and profess Christian ethics. Must we not stumble over this obvious contradiction? Obviously, we do not stumble. What is the reason? Partly it is to be found in the fact that the heritage of 4,000 years of the development of conscience is by no means completely lost. On the contrary, in many ways, the liberation of man from the powers of the of the feudal state and the church made it possible for this heritage to be brought to fruition and in the period between the 18th century and now it blossomed as perhaps never before. We still are part of this process but given our own 20th century condition of life it seems that there is no new bud which will blossom when this flower has wilted. Another reason why we do not stumble over the contradiction between humanistic ethics and fairness ethics lies in the fact that we reinterpret religious and humanistic ethics in the light of fairness ethics. A good illustration of this interpretation is the golden rule. In its original Jewish and Christian meaning, it was a popular phrasing of the biblical maxim to love thy neighbor as thyself. In the system of fairness ethics, it means simply be fair when you, when you exchange. Give what you expect to get. Don't cheat. No wonder the golden rule is the most popular religious phrase of today. It combines two opposite systems of ethics and helps us to forget the contradiction. While we still live from the Christian humanistic heritage, it is not surprising that the younger generation exhibits less and less of the traditional ethics and that we come across a moral barbarism among our youth, which is in complete contrast to the economic and educational level society has reached. Today, while revising this manuscript, I read two items. One in the New York Times regarding the fact of the murder of a man cruelly trampled to death by four teen teenagers of average middle-class families. The other in Time Magazine, a description of the new Guatemalan chief of police, who as former chief of police under the Ubico dictatorship had perfected a head-shrinking steel skull cap to pry loose secrets and crush improper political thoughts. Oh, fuck. His picture is published with the caption, For Improper Thought, A Crusher. Could anything be more insanely insensitive to extremes of sadism than the, this flippant line? Is it surprising when in a culture in which the most popular news magazine can write this, teenagers have no scruples about beating a man to death? Is the fact that we know brutality and cruelty in comic books and movies, because money is made with these commodities, not enough of an explanation for the growing barbarism and vandalism in our youth. How, how is he, like, opposed to vandalism, though? Oh, goofy old guy. Our movie censors watch that no sexual scenes are shown, since this could suggest illicit sexual desires. How innocent would this result be in comparison with the dehumanizing effect of what the censors permit and the churches seem to object to, less than to the traditional sins. Yes, we still have an ethical heritage, but it will soon be spent and will be replaced by the ethics of the brave new world, or 1984, unless it ceases to be a heritage and is recreated in our whole mode of life. 
At the moment, it seems that ethical behavior is still to be found in the concrete situation of many individuals, while society is marching toward barbarism. Much of what has been said about ethics is to be said about religion. Of course, speaking of the role of religion among alienated men, everything depends on what we call religion. If we are referring to religion in its widest sense as a system of orientation and an object of devotion, then indeed every human being is religious, since nobody can live without such a system and remain sane. Then our culture is as religious as any. Our gods are the machine and the idea of efficiency. The meaning of our life is to move, to forge ahead, to arrive as near to the top as possible. But if by religion we mean monotheism, then indeed our religion is not more than one of the commodities in our show windows. Monotheism is incompatible with alienation and with our ethics of fairness. It makes, man, it makes man's unfolding, his salvation, the supreme aim of life, an aim which never can be subordinated to any other. Inasmuch as God is unrecognizable, indefinable, and inasmuch as man is made in the likeness of God, man is indefinable, which means he is not and can never be considered a thing. The fight between monotheism and idolatry is exactly the fight between the productive and the alienated, alienated way of life. Our culture is perhaps the first completely secularized culture in human history. We have shoved away awareness of and concern with the fundamental problems of human existence. We are not concerned with the meaning of life, with the solution to it. We start out with the conviction that there is no purpose except to invest life successfully and to get it over with without major mishaps. The majority of us believe in God, take it for granted that God exists. The rest who do not believe take it for granted that God does not exist. Either way, God is taken for granted. Neither belief nor disbelief cause any sleepless nights, nor any serious concern. In fact, whether a man in our culture believes in God or not makes hardly any difference, either from a psychological or from a truly religious standpoint. In both instances, he does not care, either about God or about the answer to the problem of his own existence. Just as brotherly love has been replaced by impersonal fairness, God has been transformed into a remote general director of universe incorporated. You know that he is there. He runs the show, although it probably would run him, run without him too. You never see him, but you acknowledge his leadership while you are doing your part. The religious renaissance which we witness in these days is perhaps the worst blow monotheism has yet received. Is there any greater sacrilege than to speak of the man upstairs, to teach to pray in order to make God your partner in business, to sell religion with the method and appeals used to sell soap. In view of the fact that the alienation of modern man is incompatible with monotheism, one might expect that ministers, priests, and rabbis would form the spearhead of criticism of modern capitalism. While it is true that from high Catholic quarters and from a number of less highly placed ministers and rabbis, such criticism has been voiced. All churches belong essentially to the conservative forces in modern society and use religion to keep man going and satisfied with a profoundly irreligious system. The majority of them do not seem to recognize that this type of religion will eventually degenerate into overt idolatry, unless they begin to define and then to fight against modern idolatry, rather than to make pronouncements about God and thus to use his name in vain in more than one sense. 5 work. What becomes the meaning of work in an alienated society? We've already made some brief comments about this question in the general discussion of alienation. But since this problem is of utmost importance, not only for the understanding of present day society, but also for any attempt to create a saner society, I want to deal with the nature of work separately and more extensively in the following pages. Unless man exploits others, he has to work in order to live. However primitive and simple his method of work may be, by the very fact of production he has risen above the animal kingdom, rightly has he been defined as the animal that produces. But work is not only an inescapable necessity for man, work is also his liberator from nature, his creator as a social and independent being. In the process of work, that is, the molding and changing of nature outside of himself, man molds and changes himself. 
He emerges from nature by mastering her. He develops his powers of cooperation of reason, his sense of beauty. He separates himself from nature, from the original unity with her, but at the same time unites himself with her again as her master and builder. The more his work develops, the more his individuality develops. In molding nature and recreating her, he learns to make use of his powers, increasing his skill and creativeness. Whether we think of the beautiful paintings in the caves of southern France, the ornaments on weapons among primitive people, the statues and temples of Greece, the cathedrals of the Middle Ages, the chairs and tables made by skilled craftsmen, or the cultivation of flowers, trees, or corn by peasants, all are expressions of the creative transformation of nature by man's reason and skill. In Western history, craftsmanship, especially as it developed in the 13th and 14th centuries, constitutes one of the peaks in the evolution of creative work. Work was not only a useful activity, but one which carried with it a profound satisfaction. The main features of craftsmanship have been very lucidly expressed by C.W. Mills. There is no ulterior motive in work other than the product being made and the processes of its creation. The details of daily work are meaningful because they are not detached in the worker's mind from the product of the work. The worker is free to control his own working action. The craftsman is thus able to learn from his work and to use and develop his capacities and skills in its prosecution. There's no split of work in play or work in culture. The craftsman's way of livelihood determines and infuses his entire mode of living. With the collapse of the medieval structure and the beginning of the modern mode of production, the meaning and function of work changed fundamentally, especially in the Protestant countries. Man, being afraid of his newly won freedom, was obsessed by the need to subdue his doubts and fears by developing a feverish activity. The outcome of this activity, success or failure, decided his salvation, indicating whether he was among the saved or the lost souls. Work, instead of being an activity satisfying in itself and pleasurable, became a duty and an obsession. The more it was possible to gain riches by work, the more it became a pure means to the aim of wealth and success. Work became, in Max Weber's terms, the chief factor in a system of inner-worldly asceticism, an answer to man's sense of aloneness and isolation. However, work in this sense existed only for the upper and middle classes, those who could amass some capital and employ the work of others. For the vast majority of those who had only their physical energy to sell, work became nothing but forced labor. The worker in the 18th or 19th century, who had to work 16 hours if he did not want to starve, was not doing it because he served the Lord in this way, nor because his success would show that he was among the chosen ones, but because he was forced to sell his energy to those who had the means of exploiting it. The first centuries of the modern era find the meaning of work divided into that of duty among the middle class and that of forced labor among those without property. The religious attitude toward work as a duty, which was still so prevalent in the 19th century, has been changing considerably in the last decades. Modern man does not know what to do with himself, how to spend his lifetime meaningfully, and he is driven to work in order to avoid an unbearable boredom. But work has ceased to be a moral and religious obligation in the sense of the middle class attitude of the 18th and 19th centuries. Something new has emerged. Ever increasing production, the drive to make bigger and better things, have become aims in themselves, new ideals. Work has become alienated from the working person. What happens to the industrial worker? He spends his best energy for seven or eight hours a day in producing something. He needs his work in order to make a living, but his role is essentially a passive one. He fulfills a small isolated function in a complicated and highly organized process of production, and is never confronted with his product as a whole, at least not as a producer, but only as a consumer, provided he has the money to buy his product in a store. He is concerned neither with the whole product in its physical aspects nor with its wider economic and social aspects. He is put in a certain place, has to carry out a certain task, but does not participate in the organization or management of the work. He is not interested, nor does he know why one produces this, instead of another commodity, what relation it has to the needs of society as a whole. 
The shoes, the cars, the electric bulbs are produced by the Enterprise using the machines. He is a part of the machine rather than its master as an active agent. The machine, instead of being in his service to do work for him, which once had to be performed by sheer physical energy, has become his master. Instead of the machine being the substitute for human energy, man has become a substitute for the machine. His work can be defined as the performance of acts which cannot yet be performed by machines. Work is a means of getting money, not in itself a meaningful human activity. P. Drucker, observing workers in the automobile industry, expresses, expresses this idea very succinctly. For the great majority of automobile workers, the only meaning of the job is in the paycheck, not in anything connected with the work or the product. Work appears as something unnatural, a disagreeable, meaningless, and stultifying condition of getting the paycheck devoid of dignity as well as of importance. No wonder that this puts a premium on slovenly work, on slowdowns, and on other tricks to get the same paycheck with less work. No wonder that this results in an unhappy and discontented worker, because a paycheck is not enough to base one's self-respect on. This relationship of the worker to, the, to his work is an outcome of the whole social organization of which he is a part. Being employed, he is not an active agent, has no responsibility except the proper performance of the isolated piece of work he is doing, and has little interest except the one of bringing home enough money to support himself and his family. Nothing more is expected of him or wanted from him. He is part of the equipment hired by capital, and his role and function are determined by this quality of being a piece of equipment. In recent decades, increasing attention has been paid to the psychology of the worker, and to his attitude toward his work, to the human problem of industry. But this very formulation is indicative of the underlying attitude. There's a human being spending most of his life lifetime at work, and what should be discussed is the industrial problem of human beings, rather than the, than the human problem of industry. Most investigations in the field of industrial psychology are concerned with the question of how the productivity of the individual worker can be increased, and how it can be made to work with less friction. Psychology has lent its services to human engineering, an attempt to treat the worker and employee like a machine which runs better when it is well oiled. While Taylor was primarily concerned with a better organization of the technical use of the worker's physical powers, most industrial psychologists are mainly concerned with the manipulation of the worker's psyche. The underlying idea can be formulated like this. If he works better when he is happy, then let us make him happy, secure, satisfied, or anything else, provided it raise, raises his output and diminishes fr friction. In the name of human relations, the worker is treated with all devices which suit a completely alienated person. Even happiness and human values are recommended in the interest of better relations with the public. Thus, for instance, according to Time magazine, one of the best-known American psychiatrists said to a group of 1,500 supermarket executives, It's going to be an increased satisfaction to our customers if we are happy. It is going to pay off in cold dollars and cents to management. If we could put some of these general principles of values, human relationships, really into practice. One speaks of human relations, and one means the most in human relations those between alienated automatons. One speaks of happiness and means the perfect routinization, which has driven out the last double, the last doubt, and all spontaneity. The alienated and profoundly unsatisfactory character of work results in two reactions. One, the ideal of complete laziness. The other, a deep-seated, though often unconscious hostility toward work and everything and everybody connected with it. It is not difficult to recognize the widespread longing for the state of complete laziness and passivity. Our advertising appeals to it even more than to sex. There are, of course, many useful and labor-saving gadgets, but this usefulness often serves only as a rationalization for the appeal to complete passivity and receptivity. A package of breakfast cereal is being advertised as, n as new, easier to eat. An electric toaster is advertised with these words. The most distinctly different toaster in the world. Everything is done for you with this new toaster. You need, you need not even bother to lower the bread. Power action, though a unique electric motor, gently takes the bread right out of your fingers. How many courses in languages or other subjects are announced 
with the slogan, Effortless Learning. No more of the old drudgery. Everybody knows the picture of the elderly couple in the advertisement of a life insurance company who have retired at the age of 60 and spend their life in the complete bliss of having nothing to do except just travel. Radio and television exhibit another element of this yearning for laziness, the idea of push-button power. By pushing a button or turning a knob on my machine, I have the power to produce music, speeches, ball games, and on the television set to command events of the world to appear before my eyes. The pleasure of driving cars certainly rests partly upon this same satisfaction of the wish for push-button power. By the effortless pushing of a button, a powerful machine is set in motion. Little skill and effort is needed to make the driver feel that he is the ruler of space. But there is far more serious and deep-seated reaction to the meaninglessness and boredom of work. It is a hostility toward work, which is much less conscious than our craving for laziness and inactivity. Many a businessman feels himself the prisoner of his business and the commodities he sells. He has a feeling of fraudulency about his product and a secret contempt for it. He hates his customers who force him to put up a show in order to sell. He hates his competitors because they are a threat. His employees as well as his superiors because he is in a constant competitive fight with them. Most important of all, he hates himself because he sees his life passing by without making any sense beyond the momentary intoxication of success. Of course, this hate and contempt for others and for oneself and for the very things one produces is mainly unconscious and only occasionally comes up to awareness in a fleeting thought, which is sufficiently disturbing to be set aside as quickly as possible. 6. Democracy. Just as work has become alienated, the expression of the will of the voter in modern democracy is an alienated expression. The principle of democracy is the idea that not a ruler or a small group, but the people as a whole determine their own fate and make their decisions pertaining to matters of common concern. By electing his own representatives, who in a parliament decide on the laws of the land, each citizen is supposed to exercise the function of responsible participation in the affairs of the community. By the principle of the division of powers, an ingenious system was created that served to retain the integrity and independence of the, ju of the judiciary system and to balance the respective functions of the legislature and executive. Ideally, every citizen is equally responsible for and influential in making decisions. In reality, the emerging democratic system was beset by one important contradiction operating in states with tremendous inequalities of opportunity and income. The privileged classes naturally did not want to lose the privileges which the status quo gave them, and which they could easily have lost if the will of the majority, who were without property, had found its full expression. To avoid such a danger, many among the propertyless population were excluded from the franchise, and only very slowly was the principle accepted that every citizen without restrictions and qualifications had the right to vote. In the 19th century, it seemed as if universal franchise would solve all problems of democracy. O'Connor, one of the Chartist leaders, said in 1838, universal suffrage would at once change the whole character of society from a state of watchfulness, doubt and suspicion to that of brotherly love, reciprocal interest and universal confidence. And in 1842, he said, six months after the charter is passed, every man, woman, and child in the country will be well fed, well housed, and well clothed. Since then, all great democracies have established general suffrage for men, and with the exception of Switzerland, for women. But even in the richest country in the world, one third of the population was still ill fed, ill housed, and ill clothed, to quote Franklin D. Roosevelt. The introduction of universal suffrage not only disappointed the hopes of the Chartists, it disappointed all those who believed that universal suffrage would help to transform the citizenry into responsible, active, independent personalities. It became clear that the problem of democracy today is not any more the restriction of franchise, but the manner in which the franchise is exercised. How can people express their will if they do not have any will or conviction of their own, if they are alienated automatons whose tastes, opinions, and preferences are manipulated by the big conditioning machines. 
Under these circumstances, universal suffrage becomes a fetish. If a government can prove that everybody has a right to vote and that the votes are counted honestly, it is democratic. If everybody votes but the votes are not counted honestly, or if the voter is afraid of voting against the governing party, the country is undemocratic. It is true indeed that there is a considerable and important difference between free and manipulated elections. But noting this difference must not lead us to forget the fact that even free elections do not necessarily express the will of the people. If a highly advertised brand of toothpaste is used by the majority of people because of some fantastic claims it makes in its propaganda, nobody with any sense would say that the people have made a decision in favor of the toothpaste. Well, <laughs> that's, that's like a pretty standard thing. All that could be claimed is that the propaganda was sufficiently effective to coax millions of people into believing its claims. In an alienated society, the mode in which people express their will is not very different from that of their choice in buying commodities. They are listening to the drums of propaganda, and facts mean little in comparison with the suggestive noise which hammers at them. In recent years, we see more and more how the wisdom of public relations councils determines political propaganda. Accustomed to make the public buy anything for the build-up of which there is enough money, they think of political ideas and political leaders in the same terms. They use television to build up political personalities as they use it to build up a soap. <clears throat> what matters is the effect, in sales or votes, not the rationality or usefulness of what is presented. The phenomenon found a remarkably frank expression in recent statements about the future of the Republican Party. They are to the effect that since one cannot hope the majority of voters will vote for the Republican Party, one must find a personality who wants to represent the party. Then he will get the votes. In principle, this is not different from the endorsement of a cigarette by a famous sportsman or movie actor. Actually, the functioning of the pol political machinery in a democratic country is not essentially different from the procedure on the commodity market. The political parties are not too different from big commercial enterprises, and the professional politicians try to sell their wares to the public. Their method is more and more like that of high-pressure advertising. A particularly clear formulation of this process has been given by a keen observer of the political and economic scene, J.A. Schumpeter. He starts out with the formulation of the classical 18th century concept of democracy. The democratic method is that institutional arrangement for arriving at political decisions which realizes the common good by making the people itself decide issues through the election of individuals who are to assemble in order to carry out its will. Schumpeter then analyzes modern man's attitudes toward the problem of public welfare and arrives at a result not too different from the ones outlined above. However, when we move still farther away from the private concerns of the family and the business office into those regions of national and international affairs that lack a direct and unmistakable link with those private concerns, individual volition, command of facts, and method of inference soon cease to fulfill the requirements of the classical doctrine. What strikes me most of all and seems to me to be the core of the trouble is the fact that the sense of reality is so completely lost. Normally, the great political questions take their place in the psychic the economy of the typical citizen with those leisure hour interests that have not attained the rank of hobbies and with the subjects of irresponsible conversation. These things seem so far off. They are not at all like a business proposition. Dangers may not materialize at all, and if they should, they may not prove so very serious. One feels oneself to be moving in a fictitious world. This reduced sense of reality accounts not only for a reduced sense of responsibility, but also for the absence of effective volition. One has one's phrases, of course, and one's wishes, and daydreams, and grumbles. Especially one has one's likes and dislikes. But ordinarily they do not amount to what we call a will, the psychic counterpart of purposeful, responsible action. In fact, for the private citizen musing over national affairs, there's no scope for such a will and no task at which it could develop. He is a member of an unworkable committee, the committee of the whole nation, and this is why he expends less disciplined effort on mastering a political problem 
than he expends on a game of bridge. The reduced sense of responsibility in the absence of effective volition in turn explain the ordinary citizen's ignorance and lack of judgment in matters of domestic and foreign policy, which are, if anything, more shocking in the case of educated people and of people who are successfully active in non-political walks of life than it is with uneducated people in humble situations. Information is plentiful and readily available, but this does not seem to make any difference nor should we wonder at it. We need only compare a lawyer's attitude to his brief and the same lawyer's attitude to the statements. Oh, fuck. How did I lose my spot like that? We need only compare a lawyer's attitude to his brief and the same lawyer's attitude to the statements of political fact presented in his newspaper in order to see what is the matter. In the one case, the lawyer has qualified for appreciating the relevance of his facts by years of purposeful labor done under the definite stimulus of interest in his professional competence. And under a stimulus that is no less powerful, he then bends his acquirements, his intellect, his will to the contents of the brief. In the other case, he has not taken the trouble to qualify. He does not care to absorb the information or to apply to it the canons of criticism he knows so well how to handle and he is impatient of long or complicated argument. All of this goes to show that without the initiative that comes from immediate responsibility, ignorance will persist in the face of masses of information, however complete and correct. It persists even in the face of the meritorious efforts that are being made to go beyond presenting information and to teach the use of it by means of lectures, classes, discussions, groups. Results are not zero, but they are small. People cannot be carried up the ladder. Thus, the typical citizen drops down to a lower level of mental performance as soon as he enters the political field. He argues and analyzes in a way which he would readily recognize as infantile within the sphere of his real interests. He becomes a primitive again. Schumpeter too, points to the similarity between the manufacturing of the popular will in political issues and that in commer- commercial advertising. The ways, he says, in which issues and the popular will on any issue, popular will on any, sh- any issue are being manufactured, is exactly analogous to the ways of commercial advertising. We find the same attempts to, cont- to contact the subconscious, sub- subconscious. We find the same technique of creating favorable and unfavorable associations which are the more effective, the less rational they are. We find the same evasions and reticences and the same trick of producing opinion by reiterated assertion that is successful successful precisely to the extent to which it avoids rational argument and the danger of awakening the critical faculties of the people, and so on. Only all these arts have infinitely more scope in the sphere of public affairs than they have in the sphere of private and professional life. The picture of the prettiest girl that ever lived will in the long run prove powerless to maintain the sales of a bad cigarette. There's no equally effective safeguard in the case of political decisions. Many decisions of fateful importance are of a nature that makes it impossible for the public to experiment with them at its leisure and at moderate cost. Even if that is possible, however, Judgment is, as a rule, not so easy to arrive at as it is in the case of the cigarette, because effects are less easy to interpret. On the basis of his analysis, Schumpeter arrives at a definition of democracy which, while less lofty than the first one, is undoubtedly more realistic. The democratic method is that institutional arrangement for arriving at political decisions in which individuals acquire the power to decide by means of a competitive struggle for the people's vote. The comparison between the process of opinion formation in politics with that in the commodity market can be supplemented with another one dealing not so much with the formation of opinion, but rather with its expression. I am referring to the role of the stockholder in America's big corporations and of the influence of his will on the management. As has been pointed out above, ownership in the big corporations rests today in the hands of hundreds of thousands of individuals each of whom owns an exceedingly small fraction of the total stocks. Legally speaking, the stockholders own the enterprise and hence have the right to determine its policy and to appoint the management. 
practically speaking, they feel little responsibility for their ownership and acquiesce in what the management does, satisfied to have a regular income. The vast majority of the stockholders do not bother to go to the meetings and are willing to send the required proxies to the management. As has been pointed out above, only in 6% of the big corporations in 1930 is control exercised by total or majority ownership. The situation of control in a modern democracy is not too different from the control in a big corporation. It is true over 50% of the voters cast their votes personally. They make the decision between two party machines competing for their votes. Once one of the machines is voted into office, the relationship to the voter becomes remote. The real decisions often do not lie anymore with individual members of the parliament, representing the interests and wishes of their constituency, but with the party. But even there, decisions are made by influential key personalities, often little known to the public. The fact is that while the individual citizen believes that he directs the decision of his country, uh, the decisions of his country, he does, he does it only a little more than the average stockholder participates in the controlling of his company. Between the act of voting and the most momentous high-level political decisions in a connection is a connection which is mysterious. One cannot say that there is none at all, nor can one say that the final decision is an outcome of the voter's will. This is exactly the situation of an alienated expression of the citizen's will. He does something, voting, as is under, and is under the illusion that he is the creator of decisions which he accepts as if they were his own while in reality they are largely determined by forces beyond his control and knowledge. No wonder this situation gives the average citizen a deep sense of powerlessness in political matters, though not necessarily consciously so, and hence that his political intelligence is reduced more and more. For, for while it is true that one must think before one acts, it is also true that if one has no chance to act, the thinking becomes impoverished. In other words, if one cannot act effectively, one cannot think productively either. 3. Alienation and Mental Health What is the effect of alienation on mental health? The answer depends, of course, on what is meant by health. If it means that man can fulfill his social function, carry on with production, and reproduce himself, alienated man can quite obviously be healthy. After all, we have created the most powerful production machine which has existed so far on Earth even though we have also created the most powerful destruction machine accessible to the grasp of the madman. If we looked into the current psychiatric definition of mental health, then one should think, too, that we are healthy. Quite naturally, the concepts of health and illness are the products of those men who formulate them, hence of the culture in which these men live. Alienated psychiatrists will define mental health in terms of the alienated personality and therefore consider healthy what might be considered sick from the standpoint of normative humanism. In this respect, what H. G. Wells has described so beautifully for the psychiatrists and surgeons in the country of the blind also holds true for many psychiatrists in our culture. The young man who is found in abode in an isolated tribe of congenitally blind people is examined by their doctors. Then afterwards, one of the elders who thought deeply had an idea. He was the great doctor among these people, their medicine man, and he had a very philosophical and inventive mind, and the idea of curing Nunez of his peculiarities appealed to him. One day when Jacob was present, he returned to the topic of Nunez. I have examined Bogota, he said, and the case is clear to me. I think very, po very probably he might be cured. That is what I have always hoped, said old Jacob. His brain is affected, said the blind doctor. The elders murmured assent. Now what affects it? Ah, said old Jacob. This, said the doctor, answering his own question. Those queer things that are called the eyes, and which exist to make an agreeable soft depression in the face, are diseased. In the case of Bogota, in such a way as to affect his brain, they are greatly distended. He has eyelashes, and his eyelids move, and consequently his brain is in a state of constant irritation and distraction. Yes, said old Jacob, yes, and I think I may say with reasonable certainty that in order to cure him completely, all that we need to do, all that we need do is, is a simple and easy surgical operation, namely to remove these irritant bodies. 
and then he will be sane. Then he will be perfectly sane and a quite admirable citizen. Thank heaven for science, said old Jacob, and went forth at once to tell Nunez of his happy hopes. Our current psychiatric definitions of mental health stress those qualities which are part of the alienated social character of our time. Adjustment, cooperativeness, aggressiveness, tolerance, ambition, etc. I quoted above Strecker's definition of maturity as an illustration for the naive translation of an ad for a junior executive into psychiatric parlance. But as was already briefly mentioned in another context, even one of the most profound and brilliant psychoanalysts of our period, H.S. Sullivan, was influenced in his theor theoretical concepts for the all-pervasive alienation. Just because of his eminence and the important contribution he made to psychiatry, it will be enlightening to dwell somewhat on this point. Sullivan took the fact that the alienated person lacks a feeling of selfhood and experiences himself in terms of a response to the expectation of others as part of human nature, just as Freud had taken the competitiveness characteristic of the beginning of the century as a natural phenomenon. Sullivan thus called the view that there exists a unique individual self the delusion of unique individuality. Equally clear is the influence of alienated thinking on his formulation of the basic needs of man. They are, according to him, the need for personal security, that is, for freedom from anxiety, the need for intimacy, that is, for collaboration with at least one other person, and the need for lustful satisfaction, which is concerned with genital activity in pursuit of the orgasm. The three criteria for mental health which Sullivan postulates here are quite generally accepted. At first glance, nobody will have any quarrel with the idea that love, security, and sexual satisfaction are perfectly normal goals of mental health. A critical examination of these concepts, however, however, shows that they mean something different in an alienated world than what they might have meant in other cultures. Perhaps the most popular modern concept in the arsenal of psychiatric formulae is that of security. In recent years, there is an increasing emphasis on the concept of security as the paramount aim of life and as the essence of mental health. One reason for this attitude lies perhaps in the fact that the threat of war hanging over the world for many years has increased the longing for security. Another more important reason lies in the fact that people feel increasingly more insecure as the result of an increasing automization and overconformity. The problem becomes more complicated by the confusion between psychic and economic security. It is one of the fundamental changes of the last 50 years that in all Western countries, the principle has been adopted that every citizen must have a minimum material security in case of unemployment, sickness, and old age. Yet, while this principle has been adopted, there is still among many businessmen intense hostility against it, and especially its widening application. They speak contemptuously of the welfare state as killing private initiative and the spirit of adventure, and in fighting social security measures, they pretend to fight for the freedom and initiative of the worker. That these arguments are sheer rationalizations is evidenced by the fact that the same people have no qualms about praising economic security as one of the chief aims of life. One needs only to read the advertisements of insurance companies, with their promises to free their customers from insecurity which could be caused by accidents, death, sickness, old age, etc., to be aware of the important role which the ideal of economic security plays for the money class, and what else is the idea of saving but practicing the aim of economic security. This contradiction between the denunciation of the striving for security among the working class and the praise of the same aim for those in the higher income brackets is another example of man's unlimited capacity for thinking contradictory thoughts without even making a feeble attempt to become aware of the contradiction. Yet the propaganda against the welfare state and the principle of economic security is more effective than it would otherwise be because of the widespread confusion between economic and emotional security. Increasingly, people feel that they should have no doubts, no problems, that they should have to take no risks, and that they should always feel secure. Psychiatry and psychoanalysis have lent considerable support to this aim. Many writers in this field postulate security as the main aim of psychic development and consider a sense of security more or less equivalent with mental health. Sullivan is the most profound and the most searching among these. 
Thus, parents, especially those who follow this literature, get worried that their little son or daughter may, at an early age, acquire a sense of insecurity. They try to help them avoid conflicts, to make everything easy, to do away with as many obstacles as they can, in order to make the child feel secure, just as they try to inoculate the child against all illnesses and to prevent it from getting in touch with any germ they think can they think can banish insecurity sorry they think they can banish insecurity by preventing any contact with it the result is often as unfortunate as exaggerated hygiene sometimes is once an infection occurs the person becomes more vulnerable and helpless before it how can a sensitive and alive person ever feel secure because of the very conditions of our existence we cannot feel secure about anything our thoughts and insights are at best partial truths mixed with a great deal of error, not to speak of the unnecessary misinformation about life and society to which we are exposed almost from the day of birth. Our life and health are subject to accidents beyond our control. If we make a decision, we can never be certain of the outcome. Any decision implies a risk of failure, and if it does not imply it, it has not been a decision in the true sense of the word. We can never be certain of the outcome come up the outcome of our best efforts. I don't know. The results always depends on many factors which transcend our capacity of control. Just as a sensitive and alive person cannot avoid being sad, they cannot avoid feeling insecure. The psychic task which a person can and must set for himself is not to feel it, not to feel secure, but to be able to talk uh, fuck but to be able to tolerate insecurity without panic and undue fear. Life in its mental and spiritual aspects is by necessity insecure and uncertain. There is certainly only about the f- there is certainty only about the fact that we are born and that we shall die. There is complete security only in an equally complete submission to powers which are supposed to be strong and enduring and which relieve man from the necessity of making decisions, taking risks, and having responsibilities. Free man is by necessity insecure, thinking man by necessity uncertain. How then can man tolerate this insecurity inherent in human existence? One way is to be rooted in the group in such a way that the feeling of identity is guaranteed by the membership to the group, be it family, clan, nation, class. As long as the process of individualism has not reached a stage where the individual emerges from these primary bonds, he is still we. And as long as the group functions, he is certain of his own identity by his membership in it. The development of modern society has led to the dissolution of these primary bonds. Modern man is essentially alone. He is put on his own feet, expected to stand all by himself. He can achieve a sense of identity only by developing the unique and particular entity which is he to a point where he can truly sense I am I. This accomplishment is possible only if he develops his active powers to such an extent that he can be related to the world without having to submerge in it, if he can achieve a productive orientation. The alienated person, however, tries to solve the problem in a different way, namely by conforming. He feels secure in being as similar as possible to his fellow man. His paramount aim is to be approved of by others. His central fear that he may not be approved of. To be different, to find himself in a minority, are the dangers which threaten his sense of security. Hence a craving for limitless conformity. It is obvious that this craving for conformity produces in turn a continuously operating though hidden sense of security and any deviation from the pattern, any criticism arouses fear and insecurity. One is always dependent on the approval of others, just as a drug addict is dependent on his drug and similarly one's own sense of self and self-reliance becomes ever increasingly weaker. The sense of guilt, which some generations ago pervaded the life of man with reference to sin, has been replaced by a sense of uneasiness and inadequacy with regard to being different. Another goal of mental health, love, like that of security, has assumed a new meaning in the alienated situation. For Freud, according to the spirit of his time, love was basically a sexual phenomenon. Man, having found by experience that sexual, genital love afforded him his greatest gratification, 
so that it became in fact a prototype of all happiness to him, must have been thereby impelled to seek his happiness further along the path of sexual relations, to make genital eroticism the central point of his life. In doing so, he becomes to a very dangerous degree dependent on a part of the outer world, namely on his chosen love object, and this exposes him to most painful suffering if he is rejected by it or loses it by death or defection. In order to protect himself from the danger of suffering by love, man, but only a small minority, can transform the erotic functions of love by transferring the main value from the fact of being loved to their own act of loving, and by attaching their love not to individual objects, but to all men equally. Thus, they avoid the uncertainties and disappointments of genital love by, by turning away from its sexual aim and modifying the instinct into an impulse with an inhibited aim. Love, love with an inhibited aim was indeed originally full sensual love, and in men's unconscious minds is so still. The feeling of oneness and fusion with the world, the oceanic feeling, which is the essence of religious experience and specifically of mystical experience, and the experience of oneness and union with the beloved person is interpreted by Freud as a regression of a state or as a regression to a state of an early limitless narcissism. In accordance with his basic concepts, mental health for Freud is the full achievement of the capacity for love, which is attained if the libido development has reached the genital stage. In H.S. Sullivan's psychoanalytic system, we find, in contrast to Freud, a strict division between sexuality and love. What is the meaning of love and intimacy in Sullivan's concept? Intimacy is that type of situation involving two people which permits validation of all components of personal worth. Validation of personal worth requires a type of relationship which I call collaboration, by which I mean clearly formulated adjustments of one's behavior to the expressed needs of the other person in the pursuit of increasingly identical, that is, more and more nearly mutual satisfactions, and in the maintenance of increasingly similar security operations. Sullivan, putting it more simply, defined the essence of love as a situation of collaboration in which two people feel. We play according to the rules of the game to preserve our prestige and feeling of superiority and merit. Just as Freud's concept of love is a description of the experience of the patriarchal male in terms of 19th century materialism, Sullivan's description refers to the experience of the alienated marketing personality of the 20th century. It is a description of an egotism à deux, of two people pooling their common interests and standing together against a hostile and alienated world. Actually, his definition of intimacy is in principle valid for the feeling of any cooperating team in which everybody adjusts his behavior to the expressed needs of the other person in the pursuit of common aims. It is remarkable that Sullivan speaks here of expressed needs when the least one could say about love is that it implies a reaction to unexpressed needs between two people. In more popular terms, one can discover the marketing connotation of love in discussions on marital love and on the need for children for love and affection. In numerous articles, in counseling, in lectures, marital love is described as a state of mutual fairness and mutual manipulation called understanding each other. The wife is supposed to consider the needs and sensibilities of the husband and vice versa. If he comes home tired and disgruntled, she should not ask him questions, or should ask him questions, according to what the authors think is best for oiling him. And he should say appreciative words about her cooking or her new dress, and all this in the name of love. Every day now, one can hear that a child must get affection in order to feel secure, or that another child did not get enough love from his parents, and that is why he became a criminal or a schizophrenic. Love and affection have assumed the same meaning as that of the formula for the baby, or the college education one should get, or the latest film one should take in. You feed love as you feed security, knowledge, and everything else, and you have a happy person. Happiness is another and one of the more popular concepts by which mental health is defined today as the formula runs in the brave new world. Um... <laughs> Everybody is happy nowadays. Sorry, I lost my spot. What is meant by happiness? Most people today would probably answer the question by saying that to be happy is to have fun or to have a good time. 
The answer to the question, what is fun, depends somewhat on the economic situation of the individual and more on his education and personality structure. Economic differences, however, are not as important as they may seem. The god time of society's upper strata is the fun model for those not yet able to pay for it, while earnestly hoping for that happy eventuality. And the good time of society's lower strata is increasingly a cheaper imitation of the upper strata's differing in cost, but not so much in quality. What does this fun consist in? Going to the movies, parties, ball games, listening to the radio and watching television, taking a ride in the car on Sundays, making love, sleeping late on Sunday mornings, and traveling for those who can afford it. If we use a more respectable term instead of the word fun and having a good time, we, may, we might say that the concept of happiness is at best identified with that of pleasure. Taking into consideration our discussion of the problem of consumption, we can define the concept somewhat more accurately as the pleasure of unrestricted consumption. Um, Push-button power and laziness. From the standpoint, from this standpoint, happiness could be defined as the opposite of sadness or sorrow, and indeed the average person defines happiness as a state of mind which is free from sadness or sorrow. This definition, however, shows that there is something profoundly wrong in this concept of happiness. A person who is alive and sensitive cannot fail to be sad and to feel sorrow many times in his life. This is so not only because of the amount of unnecessary suffering produced by the imper imperfection of our social arrangements, but because of the nature of human existence, which makes it impossible not to react to life with a good deal of pain and sorrow. Since we are living beings, we, are, we must be sadly aware of the necessary gap between our aspirations and what can be achieved in our short and troubled life. Since death confronts us with the inevitable fact that either we shall die before our loved ones or they before us, since we see suffering, the unavoidable as well as the unnecessary and wasteful around us every day, how can we avoid the experience of pain and sorrow? The effort to avoid it is only possible if we reduce our sensitivity, responsiveness, and love, if we harden our hearts and withdraw our attention and our feeling from others, as well as from ourselves." If we want to define happiness by its opposite, we must define it. We must define it uh, not in contrast to sadness, but in contrast to depression. What is depression? It is the inability to feel. It is the sense of being dead while our body is still alive. It is the inability to experience joy as well as the inability to experience sadness. A depressed person would be greatly relieved if he could feel sad. A state of depression is so unbearable because one is incapable of feeling anything, either joy or sadness. If we try to define happiness in contrast to depression, we approach Sp Spinoza's definition of joy and happiness as that state of intensified vitality that fuses into one whole our effort both to understand our fellow men and be one with them. Happiness results from the experience of productive living and the use of the powers of love and reason, which unite us with the world. Happiness consists in our touching the rock bottom of reality, in the discovery of our self and our oneness with others, as well as our difference from them. Happiness is a state of intense inner activity and the experience of the increasing vital energy which occurs in productive relatedness to the world and to ourselves. It follows that happiness cannot be found in the state of inner passivity and in the consumer attitude which pervades the life of alienated man. Happiness is to experience fullness, not emptiness, which needs to be filled. The average man today may have a good deal of fun and pleasure, but in spite of this, he is fundamentally depressed. Perhaps it clarifies the issue of instead of using the word depressed, perhaps it clarifies the issue if instead of using the word depressed, we use the word bored. Actually, there is very little difference between the two, except a difference in degree, because boredom is nothing but the experience of a paralysis of our productive powers and the sense of unaliveness. Among the evils of life, there are a few which are as painful as boredom, and consequently every attempt is made to avoid it. It can be avoided in two ways. 
either fundamentally by being productive and in this manner ex experiencing happiness, or by trying to avoid its manifestations. The latter attempt seems to characterize the chasing after fun and pleasure in the average person today. He senses his depression and boredom, which become which becomes manifest when he is alone with himself or with those closest to him. All our amusements serve the purpose of making it easy for him to run away from himself and from the threatening boredom by take and f from the threatening boredom by taking refuge in the many ways of escape which our culture offers him. Yet covering up a symptom does not do away with the conditions which produce it. Aside from the fear of physical illness or of being humiliated by the loss of status and prestige, the fear of boredom plays a paramount role among the fears of modern man. In a world of fun and amusement, he is afraid of boredom and glad when another day has passed without mishap. Another hour has been killed without his having become aware of the lurking boredom. From the standpoint of normative humanism, we must arrive at a different concept of mental health. The very person who is considered healthy in the categories of an alienated world, from the humanistic standpoint, appears as the sickest one, although not in terms of individual sickness, but of the socially patterned defect. Mental health, in the humanistic sense, is characterized by the ability to love and to create, by the emergence from the incestuous ties to family and nature, by a sense of identity based on one's experience of self as the subject and agent of one's powers, by the grasp of reality inside and outside of ourselves, that is, by the development of objectivity and reason. The aim of life is to live it intensely, to be fully born, to be fully awake, to emerge from the ideas of infantile grandiosity into the conviction of one's real, though limited, strength. To be able to accept the paradox that every one of us is the most important thing there is in the universe, and at the same time not more important than a fly or a blade of grass. To be able to love life and yet to accept death without terror. To tolerate uncertainty about the most important questions with which life confronts us, and yet to have faith in our thought and feeling, inasmuch as they are truly ours. To be able to be alone, and at the same time one with a loved person, with every brother on this earth, with all that is alive, to follow the voice of our conscience, the voice that calls us to ourselves, yet not to indulge in self-hate when the voice of conscience was not loud enough to be heard and followed. The mentally healthy person is the person who lives by love, reason and faith, who respects life, his own and that of his fellow man. The alienated person, as we have tried to describe him in this chapter, cannot be healthy. Since he experiences himself as a thing, an investment to be manipulated by himself and by others, he is lacking in his sense of self. This lack of self creates deep anxiety. The anxiety engendered by confronting him with the abyss of nothingness is more terrifying than even the tortures of hell. In the vision of hell, I am punished and tortured. In the vision of nothingness, I am driven to the border of madness. Because I cannot say I anymore. If the modern age has been rightly called the age of anxiety, it is primarily because of this anxiety engendered by the lack of self. And as much as I am, as you desire me, I am not. I am anxious, dependent on approval of others, constantly trying to please the alienated person feels inferior whenever he suspects himself of not being in line. Since his sense of worth is based on approval as the reward for conformity, he feels naturally threatened in his sense of self and in his, su in, and in his self-esteem by any feeling, thought, or action which could be suspected of being a deviation. Yet, inasmuch as he is human and not an automaton, he cannot help deviating, hence he must feel afraid of disapproval all the time. As a result, he has to try all the harder to conform, to be approved of, to be successful. Not the voice of his conscience gives his strength and security, but the feeling of not having lost the close touch with the herd. Another result of alienation is the prevalence of a feeling of guilt. It is indeed amazing that in, an, in as fundamentally irreligious a culture as ours, 
the sense of guilt should be so widespread and deep-rooted as it is. The main difference from, let us say, a Calvinistic community is the fact that the feeling of guilt is neither very conscious nor does it refer to a religiously patterned concept of sin. But if we scratch the surface, we find that people feel guilty about hundreds of things. For not having worked hard enough, for having been too protective or not protective enough toward their children, for not having done enough for mother, or for having been too kind-hearted to a debtor. People feel guilty for having done good things as well as for having done bad things. It is almost as if they had to find something to feel guilty about. What could be the cause of so much guilt feeling? It seems that there are two main sources which, though entirely different in themselves, lead to the same result. The one source is the same as that from which the feelings of inferiority spring. Not to be like the rest, not to be totally adjusted, makes one feel guilty toward the commands of the great it. The other source of guilt feeling is man's, own, man's one conscience. He senses his gifts or talents, his ability to love, to think, to laugh, to cry, to wonder, and to create. He senses that his life is the one chance he is given, and that if he loses this chance, he, is, he has lost everything. He lives in a world with more comfort and ease than his ancestors ever knew, yet he senses that, chasing after more comfort, his life runs through his fingers like sand. He cannot help feeling guilty for the waste, for the, lo for the lost chance. This feeling of guilt is much less conscious than the first one, but one reinforces the other, the one often serving as a rationalization for the other. Thus, alienated man feels guilty for being, man, for being himself, and for, not, and for not being himself, for being alive, and for being an automaton, for being a person, and for being a thing. Alienated man is unhappy. Consumption of funds serves to repress the awareness of his unhappiness. He tries to save time, and yet he is eager to kill the time he has saved. He is glad to have finished another day without failure or humiliation, rather than to greet the new day with the enthusiasm which only the I am I experience can give. He is lacking the constant flow of energy which stems from productive relatedness to the world. Having no faith, being deaf to the voice of conscience, and having a manipulating intelligence but little reason, he is bewildered disquieted and willing to appoint to the position of a leader anyone who offers him a total solution. Can the picture of alienation be connected with any of the established pictures of mental illness? In answering this question, we must remember that man has two ways of relating himself to the world, one in which he sees the world as he needs to see it in order to manipulate or use it. Essentially, this is... This is sense experience and common sense experience our eye sees that which we have to see our ear hears what we have to hear in order to live our common sense perceives things in a manner which enables us to act both senses and common sense work in the service of survival in the matter of sense and common sense and for the logic built upon them things are the same for all people because the laws of their use are the same the other faculty of man is to see things from within, as it were, subjectively formed by my inner experience, feeling mood, sorry, by my inner experience, feeling, or mood. Ten painters paint the same tree in one sense, yet they paint ten different trees in another. Each tree is an expression of their individuality while also being the same tree. In the dream, we see the world entirely from within. It loses its objective meaning and, it's trans and is transformed into a symbol of our own purely individual experience. The person who dreams while awake, that is, the person who is in touch only with his inner world and who is incapable of perceiving the outer world in its objective action context, is insane. The person who can only experience the outer world photographically but is out of touch with his inner world, with himself, is the alienated person. Schizophrenia and alienation are complementary. In both forms of sickness, one pole of human experience is lacking. If both poles are present, we can speak of the productive person, whose very productiveness results from the polarity between an inner and an outer form of perception. Our description of the alienated character of contemporary man is somewhat one-sided. 
there are a number of positive factors which I have failed to mention. There is, in the first place, still a humanistic tradition alive, which has not been destroyed by the inhuman process of alienation. But beyond that, there are signs that people are increasingly dissatisfied and disappointed with their way of life and trying to regain some of their lost selfhood and productivity. Millions of people listen to good music in concert halls or over the radio. An ever-increasing number of people paint, do gardening, build their own boats or houses, indulge in any number of do-it-yourself activities. Adult education is spreading, and even in business, the awareness is growing that an executive should have reason and not only intelligence. But promising and real as all these trends are, they are not enough to justify an attitude which is to be found among a number of very sophisticated writers who claim that criticisms of our society, such as the one which has been offered here, are dated and old-fashioned, that we have already passed the peak of alienation and are now on our way to a better world. Appealing as this type of optimism is, it is nevertheless only a more sophisticated form of the defense of the status quo, a translation of the praise of the American way of life into the concepts of, concepts of cultural anthropology, which, enriched by Marx and Freud, has gone beyond them and is reassuring man that there is no reason for serious worry.